Welcome to the Stimson Center. My name is James Siebens, and I'm a fellow here with the Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Program, where I lead our work on defense strategy and planning. Uh, my role is really focused on the use of military force in great power competition, especially its function in supporting or advancing foreign policy objectives short of war. Now, over these past few years, my colleagues and I have conducted what I think will be one of the most comprehensive examinations to date, focusing specifically on how China has employed its armed forces short of sustained armed conflict to advance foreign policy objectives. The result is this book, entitled China's Use of Armed Coercion to Win Without Fighting, recently published by Rutledge. It's available for purchase here in the hallway or online. Um, but the version that has the Stimson logo on the cover is only available here for a limited time only. So that's, <laughs> that's the uh, real sell there. Um, and I want to assure you all that your purchase of this book will in no way support uh, or benefit me financially, so you should be uh, encouraged by that. Uh, but I want to welcome you all here and thank you for joining me for an in-depth dive into this study, which has really been the work of several years. So I'd like to start today's presentation by giving you just a bit of background on the study, and uh, then I'll turn over the podium to Admiral James G. Fogo for keynote remarks. Then we'll sit down with several of my co-authors uh, here on stage to discuss some of our key findings, and then we'll open up to a conversation with all of you and address as many of your questions as time permits. But first, I'd like to thank the Smith Richardson Foundation and the Stand Together Trust for making this project possible. I'd also like to thank the leadership of the Stimson Center, especially Brian Finley and Rachel Stoll, for giving me the opportunity to take this project on. I'd also like to thank Yun Sun, or Sun Yun, depending on who you ask, uh, the director of our China program, for all of her guidance and support, especially in the earliest stages of this project, as I attempted to apply this particular lens to the complex military and diplomatic history of China. Lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank Ryan Lucas, who was my research assistant for the first year of this project and who made invaluable contributions to the book, as well as all of the interns who worked with me on the defense strategy and planning scope of work. Uh, if anybody here was a DSP intern, please stand and be recognized. That's Will. So, the intellectual heritage of this project really traces back in important ways to the work of Thomas Schelling, whose book Arms and Influence pioneered the theory of coercive bargaining, and also the work of Alexander George, who further developed the concept of coercive diplomacy. But most importantly, this book traces to the work of Dr. Barry Blackman, one of the founders of the Stimson Center, whose 1978 book, Force Without War, the U.S. Armed Forces as a Political Instrument, which was co-authored with Stephen Kaplan, really provided the basis, the theoretical and methodological underpinnings for this project. A central insight of that book was that the majority of what the military does to contribute to U.S. foreign policy is not actually fighting and winning the nation's wars, but rather shaping the international security environment. It does so through military signaling, to convey resolve, and demonstrative uses of force to deter behaviors that we don't want and change behaviors that we don't like. Blackman and Kaplan wrote that when force is used as a political instrument, quote, goals are achieved through the effect of force on the perceptions of the actor. Now in 2020, I co-edited a book with Dr. Blackman and Dr. Sisson on stage here, uh, entitled Military Coercion and U.S. Foreign Policy the use of force short of war, which is a study of post-Cold War U.S. military operations that were intended to, sh to advance specific goals vis-a-vis -vis other governments. To build on that study, I decided to undertake this project on China, which I hoped could help establish some common reference points for understanding and even comparing how the world's preeminent military powers use their armed forces in peacetime to advance political and diplomatic objectives and defend their interests. Obviously, the U.S. and China are not the only countries that use force to produce psychological and political effects on other states. 
This is, in fact, an inherent part of statecraft, especially among powerful countries. So, in my view, this kind of thinking about the utility of military force is actually more germane to great power competition than war fighting, something for which we must prepare, but which we also must avoid. This is why my colleagues and I have put so much effort into advancing our collective understanding of the ways in which the U.S. and China have pursued political objectives through military signaling, through coercive diplomacy, and through competition in the gray zone below armed conflict. How the U.S. and China conduct themselves in the coming years, especially how both sides' armed forces interact and communicate with one another and with others in the region, will have significant implications for relations between the U.S. and China and thus for regional and global security. As the war in Ukraine clearly demonstrates, and as many war games focused on various contingency scenarios in the Pacific have found, a modern great power war, complete with all of the advanced tools and technologies and tactics that that would entail, would simply be devastating. As such, while our armed forces must be trained, equipped, and prepared to prevail in any number of conflict scenarios, competition short of war, especially deterrence and support for diplomacy, must be considered the most important aspect and object of U.S. military strategy. As former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis put it, quote, our military's role is to keep the peace, to keep the peace for one more year, one more month, one more week, one more day to ensure our diplomats who are working to solve problems do so from a position of strength and giving our allies confidence in us. I'm honored to be joined by Admiral James G. Fogo today, whom I've invited to begin our discussion with a glimpse into the ways in which the U.S. military, and especially the Navy, contributes to that mission of keeping the peace, especially in the context of China, including both deterrence and diplomacy. Admiral Fogo needs no introduction, but since I'm standing here, uh, in brief, he is a four retired four-star admiral in the U.S. Navy, currently serving as dean for the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, an Olmsted Scholar, a Moreau Scholar, and holds advanced degrees from Harvard University and the University of Strasbourg. Admiral Fogo has a wealth of experience in both the operational art of deterrence as a submariner and the art of military diplomacy. He also has experience with the kinds of military-to-military -military exchanges, negotiations, and dialogue that the U.S. and China have thankfully been able to resume following the Biden-Xi summit. Admiral, we look forward to hearing from your experience with the Navy's combined role of deterrence and diplomacy. Thank you. James, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that warm welcome. And I have to say that uh, I can see further now because I have stood on the shoulders of giants like Barry Blackman. Barry, when I was a student at uh, the John F. Kennedy School of Government in 1986, I had some great professors, Joe Nye, Graham Allison, Al Carnesale, Ernest May, and uh, Richard Haas, and your book was on the top of the list, Force Without War. So thank you. Uh, great to be here. Great to see Melanie again and meet some new faces. Um, if I can have my first slide, please. Today I want to talk about the Navy uh, as a tool of diplomacy. And I reside at the Navy League of the United States on Wilson Boulevard. I am the dean of uh, the Center for Maritime Strategy, which advocates sea power. Uh, to sum up the career uh, of 40 years that I was fortunate enough to do, it was an interview with Admiral Rickover right in the submarine force, uh, 40 years. Three twelves. Twelve years underwater, twelve years in the Pentagon. That was like being underwater. And <clears throat> twelve years and nine commands around the world. I was blessed. And about three and a half years of uh, school and preparation for different milestones like command, engineering, uh, nuclear power. The Navy League uh, got together. Actually, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and J.P. Morgan met at the New York Yacht Club on November 20th, 1902. And uh, the Naval Order, which is still around today, brought them in and said, we need something to advocate for sea power. They created the Navy League of the United States. And that's why I'm here. And I uh, firmly subscribe to Roosevelt's quote, a good Navy is not just a provocation, it's assurance guarantor of peace. Uh, with all that's going on nowadays in Europe, Ukraine, the Red Sea, Gaza, uh, 
uh, the Houthis, Iran meddling with malign influence around the world. It's easy to lose track of what we know is the pacing threat, and that is the People's Republic of China. <clears throat> now, I want to make it clear today, this is not a PRC tie, even though it's red and gold. This is uh, the Lion of St. Mark's, which was the symbol of my last headquarters on active duty, Commander of Naval Forces Europe, Commander of Naval Forces Africa, Allied Joint Force Command, uh, Naples, Italy. The lion has one paw on the Book of Peace, Pax, and the other he's carrying a sword. So his mission is to deter and defend, and that's what we did. And Jens Stoltenberg added one more D to that deter and defend, and that was dialogue, and we tried to do that as well. Uh, next slide. So I'll tell you a little bit about my experience, and it's kind of like back to the future. On the left, you see President Obama in his first meeting with President Xi back in Sunnylands in 2013. Uh, that was an interesting meeting, and then we just had another one with uh, President Biden. President Biden's got about 94 hours of contact time on President Xi, more than any other uh, politician or diplomat in this country, and I think that's really important. They just met out in November in San Francisco, as you know, and uh, President Biden urged him to get back to the table, have a dialogue, which the Chinese have done. They're talking to our joint chiefs. They're also talking uh, to our uh, State Department through their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. When Sunny Lands happened, I got a call in to the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Greenert. He said, I just had a phone call with uh, Susan Rice, who was over at the National Security Council, and she said, out of Sunny Lands came several things. An agreement to talk about the imbalance of trade with China. Uh, an agreement to talk about uh, intellectual property with China. Uh, an agreement to talk about arms control with China. And finally, an agreement to establish rules of behavior in the maritime domain. And he said, so the Navy's got that one, Fogo, and I don't have time to do it, so you're going to do it. And you will be my representative uh, with the People's Liberation Army Navy. And I said, sir, I don't speak Mandarin. I'm a coal warrior from the Atlantic. I uh, fought the Russians all my life. And never tell the Chief of Naval Operations that because uh, he said, don't let the door hit you in the rear end on the way out and go do good things for the United States Navy. And so shortly thereafter, next slide, I found myself in Beijing at PLA Navy headquarters, which is beautiful, by the way. And uh, there are two faces circled there. One is me, the tall guy on the right, and the other is one of my two interlocutors on this discussion, uh, Rear Admiral Lee G. I was warned about Lee G. He was charming and disarming. He spoke English like an Oxford professor. They said, don't be a victim of the Stockholm Syndrome, but I relished the opportunity. It was like playing a game of chess, and he was very, very smart. The problem was the uh, Chinese and the Americans did not agree on much, and we couldn't even agree on the title of this agreement that was supposed to happen. Is it standards of behavior in the maritime domain, or is it rules of behavior? Chinese like rules. You break a rule, see, you broke a rule. We met one year later, you broke all these rules. Standards were a little loosey-goosey. The Americans believed in standards. One should not run into another ship. One should not come in the closed circle of another ship. One should not interfere with safe navigation and piloting. Um, so we didn't go anywhere for the first couple of months. It was a stalemate. And finally, <clears throat> Admiral Lee said to me, and they called me Fogo Shangzhong, which for those of you that speak Mandarin, I probably mispronounced it. It means General Fogo. I was like, I'm not a general, I'm an admiral. He said, we don't have that word in Mandarin. So you are Fogo Shangzhong. He said, Fogo Shangzhong, we have to meet. We have to resolve this. We have to have breakfast together and discuss this problem, uh, this logjam. So I went to OSD and made sure it was OK. And I met with Li Ji the following day at breakfast across a 12-foot Lazy Susan, which didn't have anything I like for breakfast because I'm a bacon and eggs kind of guy. But I had some juice and I had some tea. And he looked at me and he said, Fogo Shangzhong, do you know why we're here? And I said, of course I know why we're here. We're here to negotiate the standards of behavior in the maritime domain. He said, no, 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 it's not why we're here. We are here because if President Xi and President Obama decide to go to war, the United States and People's Republic of China, that is their decision as the leaders of our two countries. That is not the decision for men or women in the cockpit of an aircraft or on the bridge of a ship. Prophetic. I said, Admiral Lee, I couldn't agree with you more. And so we moved on. And we actually got to an agreement. Now, they called him the chief barbarian handler. And I went to my interpreter, Lieutenant Lee, Chinese Navy, very pleasant young man. I said, hey, why do they call Lee Ji the barbarian handler? He goes, 
because you, Fogo Shangsheng, you are the barbarian. <laughs> Next slide. So we got to an agreement. Susan Rice was very happy about that because we didn't agree on anything else that was on that list I told you about. So she, had, she elevated this from the Navy to the Secretary of Defense. You can see Chuck Hagel's signature. Uh, she also got the attention and the, the uh, counterpart for the Ministry of Defense in China. She also got the attention of President Obama and President Xi. And this was ratified at the ASEAN Summit in 2014. That was my ticket to leave the Pentagon. And again, I didn't like the Pentagon. I liked being operational and out at sea. That was my ticket to be the commander of the United States Sixth Fleet. Admiral Greener called me in. He said, good job and uh, good luck to you. You're headed back to Naples, Italy. And so I left. And I felt really good about what we had done. We had established an agreement with the People's Liberation Army Navy. They were actually fairly pleasant during this negotiation. And I said, we can coexist in the Western Pacific. And then when I got to Sixth Fleet, I started to see the naval arms race that was taking place. Next slide, please. And you'll see these numbers. Back in 2013, at the time that I did this, China had 255 naval ships. Going to two, in 2030 to 425 ships, we currently have less than 300 in the U.S. Navy. Now, why is that? What's the threat? What are they worried about? We're not going to invade mainland China. They've also established or built a working uh, hypersonic missile. We don't have one. They have the DF-21, DF-26 carrier killer, although based on recent reports, the fuel banks might be filled with water. Uh, they have a naval arms race uh, in nuclear weapons, and uh, they have about 350 now. They're going to 3,000 in 2030 by some reports, and my friend Chaz Richard, who used to run STRATCOM. That's more than the U.S. and Russia combined in New START. And we don't have an arms control agreement. We never got one out of sunny lands with the Chinese. So this dialogue, this diplomacy is very important. Next slide. While I was in Beijing, the Chinese would say to me, Fogo Shangzhong, have you read Joe Nye's book, Soft Power? I said, not only have I read it, he was one of my professors, and I have an autographed copy. And they said, we do soft power. And I said, no, I beg to differ. You don't do soft power. You're bullies. And you don't have a school of diplomacy. If you ever had a school of diplomacy, I'd be concerned about it. I didn't like that. But uh, if you look at Asia's Cauldron as the second book on the slide, and you think about what's gone on recently, I think uh, actually that Xi Jinping has read Robert Kaplan's work because in his battle against corruption, he's recently canned four members of the uh, strategic rocket forces that make those very threatening missiles. Uh, General Liu, uh, Li Yu Chang, uh, Liu Gangbin, uh, Zhu Zhangbo, and Zhang Zhang Zhen. Uh, he also brought up, after firing the defense minister and the foreign minister, and the foreign minister was ambassador here, Kui Gong is one of the biggest wolf warriors of all, he brought the uh, chief of naval operations, Dong Zhong, to be his secretary of defense, and he moved his head submariner, Hu Zhang Min, to be the chief of naval operations. That tells you something, because in that book by Kaplan, he talks about this isn't just the maritime decade, it's the maritime century. And she knows that. And he also knows the importance of the U.S. Navy submarine force as a threat. He also understands what Mearsheimer says in the book, quoted by Kaplan, on the stopping power of water and the tyranny of distance in the Western Pacific. So even if they want to invade Taiwan, they got some real challenges there, particularly with sustainment and supply chain. <clears throat> and that brings us to James's book, Great Job, Shipmate, China's Use of Armed Coercion. If you think about it, the U.S. State Department, he talks about this in his book, the Chinese have used gangster tactics, uh, wolf warriors, lawfare, economic warfare. I would spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in Africa. And on the west coast of Africa, I saw this all the time. There's a great uh, study by one of my friends, Ambassador George Ward, and he wrote about it in War on the Rocks, the Eagle and the Dragon in Africa, comparing data on Chinese and American influence. We still have the edge. We're still ahead of China in uh, winning the war of ideas in Africa. Some of you may not believe that, but if you look at the study, the analytics are pretty good. And Tony Blinken is in Cabo Verde today, and I think that's really important. Um, one last thing to think about as we get into the discussion, is China as dangerous as it looks? Should we take them seriously? And I believe we should, but we've seen some things lately that cause us pause.
is, next slide, the United States Navy has come to realize that this is a pretty important thing. So the Secretary of the Navy commissioned this study by the Center for Naval Analysis on uh, competition with China below the threshold of war. Now, I kicked this off at the National Press Club last month, and it really has three pillars. The Secretary likes to call this uh, maritime statecraft, and he believes that the only way that we can win is through maritime dominance, and the only way we get maritime dominance is not unilaterally, it's with strategic partners and allies, and finally, with a force that the Chinese will have to reckon with, and that's about people and sailors. And right now, our numbers in recruiting are down, so we need to take that very seriously, too. By way of a keynote, those are my remarks. I really look forward to the panel discussion today. I'm honored to be here, and thanks for inviting me, James. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral. Appreciate it. So now we'll shift the conversation into uh, China's use of military signaling, coercive diplomacy, and gray zone coercion. Over the past 20 years, as Admiral Fogo mentioned, China's international status as a global power has become undeniable. Its quote unquote peaceful rise has included substantial investments in military modernization and it has increasingly asserted its uh, dominance or potential dominance within its adjacent waters and its peripheral areas. And so while China has not waged war, it has frequently resorted to threats, intimidation, and armed confrontation to advance strategic aims. China's regional ambitions are evident from the ways in which it has asserted itself militarily, especially within the Maritime Nine Dash Line, and with respect to several ongoing territorial disputes with its neighbors. Many in the U.S. tend to view China's goals as aggressive, aimed at the creation of a China-dominated regional order, with the goal, potentially, of eventually uh, supplanting the United States as a global hegemon. Meanwhile, having completed this study, uh, it has become clear to me that China sees itself as merely growing into or resuming its natural geopolitical space, and it seeks to persuade other states to accommodate its rise or return to great power status. China generally presents its uses of force as defensive, and it blames other states for provoking it by violating its interests or declaring or uh, its declared sovereignty or its jurisdic uh, jurisdictional rights. However, over the past 20 years or so, it seems that China's objectives have become more expansive. And especially in the last decade, China has increasingly used military and paramilitary force to improve its position in these long-standing territorial disputes with other nations. This pattern is most evident in the maritime space with its neighbors in the South China Sea as well as in its tense interactions with the United States and its allies in the East China Sea and South China Sea, and China's gray zone activity around Taiwan and along the contested Sino-Indian border. So to talk about all of these issues, I'm pleased to be joined by several of my co-authors on the book. And uh, as we go down the panel, I've asked each of them to share a little bit about what they regard as the key takeaways from their contributions to the book. Um, starting with a focus on what China is seeking to accomplish through its use of armed coercion, how China tends to pursue its aims in these different contexts, and where it seems to be advancing and achieving its goals, and where it is not. And then, as I mentioned before, I'll lead us into a general discussion to address your questions. So, I'd like to go down one at a time, if I may, uh, and first introduce Professor Ketian Vivian Zhang, an assistant professor in international security at the Shar School of, po of Policy and Government at George Mason University, where she studies rising powers, coercion, economic statecraft, and maritime disputes in international relations, with a focus on China and East Asia. Ketian also recently published a book entitled China's Gambit, the Calculus of Coercion, which is about China's attempts to coerce states with which it has perceived conflicts of interest or over perceived threats to its national security. I asked Ketian to join this project as I was aware of her dissertation on the subject 
and a very well-received 2019 article in International Security in which Ketian posited that China behaves as a, quote, cautious bully. So, Ketian, welcome. Uh, starting there, how should we understand China's use of military and gray zone coercion in these contexts uh, as part of its foreign policy repertoire? Great. Um, thanks, everyone, and thank you so much, James, for um, having me on uh, this panel as well as part of the edited um, volume. Um, so I'll keep my remarks uh, relatively brief so, so that we can have more time for our discussion. But I would like to uh, discuss three points or sort of the key takeaways from uh, at least my chapter of the book. And the first one will be about the goals of China's military as well as gray zone coercion. And the second will be about um, how these coercive tools are being used and what is the pattern and rationale of China's use of coercion. And finally, uh, uh, briefly discuss um, the effectiveness or lack thereof of China's coercion. And by coercion, I mean the use or threats of negative actions to demand a change in the behavior of the target state. And of course, I do acknowledge in the Tom Shallon sense, coercion includes both compellants and deterrence. But in China, and oftentimes, there is a blurred line between compellants and um, deterrence. And I'll explain uh, why. So let's get to the first point about the goals of China's coercion. So I would argue that China treats coercion as a signaling device. So what that means is that um, China oftentimes coerces one target state in order to deter the target state as well as other states from doing similar things that China does not like them to do um, in the future. So let's take the South China Sea, uh, for example, and my colleagues will discuss them more a little bit more uh, in detail. So there are multiple disputants in the South China Sea. And China sometimes would use gray zone coercion to, for example, coerce uh, the Philippines in order to send a message to other countries, such as Vietnam and Malaysia, to prevent them from doing things that the Philippines have done that China considers as threatening to its national security uh, in the future. So and oftentimes when I um, interview uh, Chinese um, analysts and former officials uh, in the past, um, they'll quote this ancient Chinese proverb to explain their logic, which is killing the chicken to scare the monkey. But I think it would be much more accurate to paraphrase that as uh, scaring the chicken in order to scare other monkeys uh, in uh, the future. But please don't ask me about the relationship between the chickens and the monkeys in the <laughs> Q&A. I'm not sure whether they're related. But nevertheless, um, China is a cautious coercer, I would argue, um, using military coercion relatively selectively and oftentimes would actually prefer to use non-militarized, including gray zone coercion. Uh, which brings us to the second point about the patterns and rationale of China's coercive actions. So in the data set, which is in the uh, broader book that I just published last year, I created uh, a data set about China's coercion over maritime and land border disputes, issues over Taiwan, as well as foreign leaders' reception of the Dalai Lama, which China considers as a threat to its national security. So in the data set, I've collected uh, uh, from 1992-2020, there were only nine cases that involved military coercion out of the 67 cases of China's use of coercion uh, in my data set. So the rest are all various forms of uh, diplomatic sanctions, economic sanctions, and of course, gray zone coercion. And even if we take into consideration the more recent events over, for example, Taiwan in 2021, 22, or the, the most recent Taiwanese election, um, I think the pattern of um, China overwhelmingly utilizing non-military coercion still uh, stands. So you might wonder, uh, what, when does China use military coercion then? And wh when does it prefer to use non-militarized coercive tools? Um, I would argue that China oftentimes uh, refrain from military coercion when the geopolitical backlash cost is high. So by geopolitical backlash, I mean concerns that a dispute might escalate into a militarized confrontation um, if military coercion is used, and especially if the target state has mutual defense treaties with um, the United States. So if China does not want a militarized confrontation with the United States, it oftentimes wants plausible deniability, and in particular in the South China Sea cases, um, it, it will prefer to use these sorts of gray zone coercive tools. But in contrast, when we look at Sino-Indian land border disputes, China has more room for maneuver to use um, military coercion because the perceived geopolitical backlash cost is going to be much um, lower when it comes to um, India. So, and even if we take into consideration Taiwan, um, I would say Taiwan is a slightly different issue, which my colleague will explain a little bit more, because the stakes is 
considered to be much higher, and China considers Taiwan to be a core interest. Whereas the issues that I'm very much interested in, those rocks in the South China Sea, they're important, but they're not at the level of core interest. Therefore, in often times, we're more likely to observe China utilizing military coercion in issues over Taiwan. So finally, and very briefly, um, what about the effects of China's coercion? Um, does it actually uh, realize the goals that China sets it out to be? I would say it's a very difficult question to evaluate uh, any state's use of coercion or statecraft in general, but I would say um, my two cents is that uh, uh, the results are mixed. So on the one hand, um, China's use of coercion, for example, over maritime disputes, do, uh, does send a signal, a deterrent signal, to some of the disputes in the South China Sea. Um, so for example, empirically, in the early 2000s, Chinese fishermen tend to be arrested a little bit more by, say, foreign uh, uh, disputants. But ever since China used uh, extensive uh, cases of gray zone, coercion, or economic sanctions, um, we're really not seeing any sort of reports of, say, Chinese fishermen being arrested. So I would say if you're talking about um, sort of um, immediate results, there is a certain level of effectiveness. But on the other hand, coercion does have negative consequences. What that means is that it tends to bring the countries much closer to the United States. So in the long term, I would say um, course of actions will shoot China in the foot, right? So we're talking about immediate versus sort of long-term effects. And this, I would say, is inherent in China's grand strategy. So sort of my uh, second uh, book project is about comparing rising power grand strategies. And in terms of China, there is this inherent tension in which China wants to maintain stable external environment for its economic uh, development. But at the same time, it wants to set its reputation for resolve as a great power. So these two goals and oftentimes will um, uh, require China to use different, drastically different kinds of tools, economic inducement versus coercion. So inherently, this will reduce the effectiveness of Chinese coercive actions, making it at best a suboptimal choice of um, statecraft. So that's a much about it, and welcome any uh, questions in, uh, in the Q&A. Very well done. Thank you, Ketian. I have, I have one follow-up uh, uh, suggestion for you, which is I'd like to hear a little bit more about this blurry line you talked about between the concept of compellence and deterrence. Um, and I'll give an example, I think, to, to support my view on it, um, which is that really the, the concept of Weisha is more closely related to the shelling concept of coercion than it is to either deterrence or compellence by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to quote briefly from the Science of Military Strategy, which defined Weisha as a strategic activity, quote, for the purpose of achieving certain political goals to influence an opponent's strategic judgment with the threat or use of military force, end quote. So to me, that reads equally possible to, to imply compellence or deterrence. And in the case of the South China Sea, as you mentioned, since, uh, so just to, to give an example of what the goals might be, right? China is seeking to gain recognition for some of its territorial claims in the Spratly Islands, for example. Um, but it's also seeking to exploit economic resources there. Mm -hmm. And so while it has not been able to compel other claimants to give up their claims mm -hmm. or to recognize China's claim, uh, it has, uh, I think you're right, uh, been able to deter those countries from pursuing their own kind of uh, law enforcement actions against Chinese fishermen uh, in the way that they might have pursued more aggressively in, in previous years. So there might be, you know, the same set of tools is being applied to pursue deterrence and compellence simultaneously, which is why maybe it's a, it's a muddled or blurred concept, more appropriate to just say coercion. I, I think I would very much like to um, agree. Um, and um, so when I was sort of uh, uh, thinking about this concept of coercion or compellence more so, more precisely, uh, uh, I get a lot of um, pushback from scholars on coercion saying um, what exactly it is that you're studying. Um, so I, after analyzing China's coercion and patterns, um, I came to the conclusion um, that uh, it, it, the reason why it's really difficult to pinpoint China's behavior is precise because there is a very blurred line in the case of China when it comes to compellence and deterrence. And you can see that in, um, for example, the South China Sea case, in which you can 
observe uh, both compelling goals as well as I would say deterrent goals um, almost at the same time. So when it comes to compelling, it's really more about these um, um, straightforward reaction to um, the incidents that China considers as threatening, say um, arresting a Chinese fisherman or uh, a foreign oil and gas, co uh, gas company exploring in the disputed waters in the, the South China Sea. So that I think is a very much a, a, a compelling a kind of um, a goal as well as behavior. But at the same time, um, I guess one of the points that I wanted to make in the, the chapter is that a lot of the times China's goals is broader than that particular incident. And that is why I think there's also this deterrence goal in terms of China's behavior in the South China Sea as well, which is um, uh, by making sure that uh, future uh, or other disputes um, do not engage in actions that China views as threatening to its um, maritime claims in the South China Sea. In a way, it is a deterrence against a further, I guess, decline in terms of Chinese administrative control of, of the South China Sea. So I think um, you will actually see both compelling and deterrence in um, the very same um, action. And um, I think the in the uh, uh, in, in in the Chinese document. Way show where deterrence does have sort of both connotation of stopping things that the other state is already doing, as well as to prevent them from doing uh, uh, future things. So that in and of itself, I think, is a blurred line between compelling and uh, deterrence. Thank you very much. So next, I am pleased to introduce Pam Kennedy, who's the deputy director of our China program here at the Stimson Center. Uh, before climbing through the ranks at Stimson, Pam previously worked with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and at CSIS uh, with their Japan chair, and uh, as well as the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. Pam, thank you so much for joining me on this project. Uh, Pam has significant experience working on the Taiwan issue, uh, including curating the archives of one of Stimson's luminaries, the late Alan Romberg. And uh, given her expertise, I wanted to ask Pam to work with me on a case study of China's past uses of coercion and coercive diplomacy toward Taiwan, which, uh, as it turns out, has often coincided with Taiwan's elections. <laughs> Pam, thanks again for joining me. And uh, I want to invite you to share what you think are uh, some of the most important things for people to understand about China's approach to using military threats in the context of Taiwan. Thank you, James. So James and I wrote this chapter back in 2020 before the Pelosi visit was a gleam in anyone's eyes, including the PLAs. And it, over the past few years, things have really changed. We had to write a whole new section for the chapter. U.S. relations with China took a downturn. And so there's been this renewed attention on Taiwan and the dynamic in the Taiwan Strait. And it's very clear if we examine the level the intensity and the frequency of coercive activities by China towards Taiwan, that Taiwan is really on the front line of these sorts of paramilitary, military, and gray zone forms of coercion. Taiwan's been a target and a testing ground for coercion for decades. And so we looked back at just, just the past 29 years, encompassing several crises in cross-strait relations. And I'll go through them quickly. I'll try not to read the whole history. For that, you have to read the chapter. Um, but these lessons about how China tries to intimidate Taiwan are extremely relevant even today. Um, the first case study we did on the third Taiwan Straits crisis uh, occurred in 1995 and 96 as Taiwan held its first direct presidential election. Um, Taiwan had been transitioning to democracy beginning in 1987. And so this first direct and free election, China feared would be sort of the, the first major step towards Taiwan declaring formal independence, which as Ketian described is Taiwan's absolute red line on Taiwan. So China tried to sway public opinion, compel the electorate to not elect the front runner, KMT candidate and incumbent president Li Tongwei, and also tried to convince the United States to distance itself from Taiwan simultaneously. So China employed rhetoric, you know, warning Taiwan, threatening um, the, the Taiwanese diplomatic signals, recalling its ambassador from the United States, canceling official visits and meetings, closing the communications channels with Taiwan, and of course, many military demonstrations over a 10-month period, beginning in July 1995, continuing in August and November 
right ahead of the legislative UN elections that winter. Um, and then again, picking up the military exercises days before the presidential election in March of 1996. Um, Lee Tung-wei did win the election, 54% of the vote, so months of significant military intimidation efforts came to nothing, only succeeding in raising the level of tension in the Taiwan Strait to um, a, a level that had been unseen since the 1950s when the ROC and the PRC were actively at war with each other. So the question is, why did China double down on its coercion with these months of repeated efforts to intimidate Taiwan? And we posit that there are a couple possible reasons. First, in the LY elections, um, the KMT lost seats in the legislature. That followed several months of military coercion, so perhaps China thought it could work again. Um, China seems to have, in fact, interpreted it as a measure of success. But also, initially, the U.S. response to the military exercises was relatively mute. In November, the U.S. moved a battle group closer to Taiwan, but the Navy denied that it was directly connected to these exercises aimed at intimidating Taiwan. And so China probably also interpreted that it had a bit more room to stretch its coercive muscles. Uh, but still, it failed to achieve its main objective. Lee was elected president, and the U.S. then did show military support in March by moving two battle groups near Taiwan in response to the PLA exercises. Then we see a similar pattern of this escalating warnings, the diplomatic maneuvers, and then the military exercises in 1999, and then again between 2020 and 2022. So in the 1999 case, Li Tongwei gave an interview um, with Deutsche Welle in which he described the cross-strait relationship as a state-to-state -state relationship, which China immediately condemned, demanding that Li retract the statement and warning that any other leaders in Taiwan should not use that formulation. And again, the tensions built very rapidly. The U.S. played diplomatic interference. It didn't matter. PLA conducted exercises beginning in July 1999 all the way through September. Then the U.S. made an enormous arms sale to Taiwan, setting a new precedent for the arms sales that would continue to this day, in fact. Um, and the only small win China could take away was that the Clinton administration rejected itself the, the state-to-state -state formulation um, and uh, sort of denied that there was going to be a change in U.S. policy on the one China policy. Finally, the Pelosi visit. So this was preceded, of course, by six years of China uh, telegraphing its displeasure with the Tsai Ing-wen administration, whittling away Taiwan's diplomatic partners, ramping up almost exponentially the number of air defense identification zone violations, uh, going from zero in 2018 to more than 1,700 last year, and, of course, regular military exercises. And on the U.S. side of the equation, we've seen a, uh, an increase in the visits to Taiwan by higher level U.S. officials, cabinet secretary in 2020, and then in 2022, Pelosi announced that she would visit in her official capacity, the first Speaker of the House to visit since 1997. China again issued warnings. After Pelosi visited, they began the largest PLA military exercises we have seen in quite some time, uh, an implicit blockade rehearsal. So in this crisis, the military exercises came after the event, slightly different pattern, but China had already made the threat of retaliation very explicit, so it had to follow through. So how do we best understand this? Arguably, I would say China's coercion attempts towards Taiwan have been quite counterproductive towards its ultimate goal, of unification with Taiwan. People in Taiwan today tend to perceive China negatively, more than half. They are mostly uninterested in unification, though they also fear China's military power, so they do not want to declare independence and destabilize the situation. They have continued to hold regular and free elections since 1996, and they've continued to elect leaders that China does not like, Chen Shui-bian, Tsai Ing-wen, and just a couple weeks ago, Li Tong, uh, sorry, Lai Qingde. And part of the reason, I think, is that people in Taiwan are very aware of China's intimidation tactics. They've experienced this their whole lives. It doesn't matter how many speeches out of Beijing mention peaceful reunification. 
when there is a really visible pattern of military and paramilitary coercion, as well as a whole spectrum of other gray zone forms of coercion, that they may spike in times of crisis, but these are ongoing pretty much every day. And it's worth noting that China's coercion has also failed to change how the US views Taiwan. I think that the bipartisan support in Congress for Taiwan is even stronger today than it was in the 90s. And the US has continued to sell arms in vast quantities for Taiwan's defense. Um, I will wrap up quickly with the big question, why has China shown less restraint towards Taiwan in the past few years? considering the huge increase in the aerial incursions. It's a huge expense for the PLA. So why bother when it hasn't shown any results yet? One idea James and I had is that China is losing patience with Taiwan. Xi Jinping would like to make unification part of his legacy, so he needs to make progress somewhere, somehow. There's that time constraint and also the decreasing number of people in Taiwan who actually want unification. I also think that China is getting frustrated that its efforts to deter actions that it sees as undermining the One China principle and compel Taiwan and the United States to do what it wants haven't worked. So it's repeating the pattern that we've already laid out for the past 30 years, doubling down. And finally, China's military modernization efforts, which we can discuss more, do lend much greater credibility to China's ability to follow through on the use of force, and it's resolved to follow through, as Ketian said. Ch Taiwan is a core interest, so the problem is not going away. China just has to, it thinks, find the right combination of coercion to make Taiwan act. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, Pam. I, I will follow up very briefly to just add that as much as I think you are right to point out that China has failed to compel negotiations over unification or to fundamentally alter the uh, structure of Taiwan-U.S. relations. Um, it has also deterred a formal declaration of independence, uh, arguably, and has uh, maintained the U.S. one China policy, at least its, its kind of public re-articulation as including uh, that the United States does not support Taiwan independence. And so there are, remain these kinds of, uh, some of China's red lines appear intact, but they've also expressed uh, frustration with the perceived erosion of the United States one China policy, at least as it is being practiced with the you know, changes in diplomatic protocols and engaging with Taiwan officials and that sort of thing. Um, so there's arguably some salami slicing going on uh, in the, in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship that China is being very sensitive toward, I would say. Yes, you're absolutely right. China will take the wins where it can find them. For instance, after the 1996 election, China declared that its military coercion had worked because the KMT lost seats in the legislature months before, <laughs> even though Li Tenghui was elected. They'd sent the message and the message was received. I think we're seeing the same thing this time around. The DPP lost more than 10 seats in the legislature. So China does see that as a win. And it's extremely sensitive to any time uh, presidents of the United States make little gaffes and talk about Taiwan as a country <laughs> or the U.S. will support Taiwan or something, then have to walk those back as the State Department reaffirms the U.S. one China policy. Um, but it sees this cumulatively as sort of the, the erosion of the, the status quo that it's trying to use the military coercion to shore up. Excellent. Thanks so much. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce Jimmy Wang. Jimmy is a foreign area, uh, I'm sorry, a foreign affairs officer with the U.S. Department of State, specializing in the Asia Pacific region. He joined the State Department after a storied career in the U.S. military, which is really to say that he's told me some stories about his time in the military. <laughs> and uh, he began his military career as a Marine Corps infantryman, after, uh, and later received a commission in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer, and later became a Navy foreign area officer. <coughs> 
specializing in China affairs and the Indo-Pacific region. And in that capacity, he advised U.S. Pacific Fleet Command on all matters concerning the PLA, uh, PLA Navy, I should say. Um, so that's why I asked Jimmy to be a part of this project. Uh, but I must emphasize that Jimmy is here to speak solely in his capacity as a non-resident fellow with the Stimson Center's Defense Strategy and Planning Project and as a private citizen of these United States. And so none of his remarks represent any part of the U.S. government. Also, just as a professional courtesy, I haven't talked to Jimmy about this, but if anybody wants to quote him, please just send us an email. Um, so, Jimmy, thank you for joining us. Let's talk about China's approach to coercion when dealing with Japan and the Senkaku Jiaoyu Islands. Uh, since 2006, 2007, China's been regularly conducting patrols into the waters and airspace uh, of the East China Sea, including near the Senkakus. And since around 2015 or 2016, the Japanese Coast Guard has been intercepting Chinese government vessels, sometimes armed, uh, that are there to claim that the islands are, quote, China's inherent territory, and that they are, quote, conducting normal cruises in the waters under China's jurisdiction, end quote. So this has caused some consternation among our Japanese allies, shall we say. Uh, why don't you talk us through some of the key challenges there? Thank you, James. Not sure if this is working. I will try my best to. All right, good. Thank you. So it's first, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Admiral, to be sharing a stage with these things, scholars. It's, it's, it's a, my honor. Thank you. So for years, the PRC has been making extensive maritime claims in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. But uh, now they're backing them up with military and paramilitary presence. As the PRC seeks to achieve this national rejuvenation by 2049, the CCP leaders view the modern, capable, and world-class military as essential. And they're using them effectively. In Chapter 6, I discussed the PRC's patient and steady approach to foreign, to foreign policy. It's, uh, it's an advantage they have when they don't have to worry about election cycles and public opinions. They can play the long game. From being a largely ignored by the international community in the mid-1900s, the growth of its economic and military strength in the 1990s to its current credible show of force in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. They are gaining attention. The 2023 DOD report to Congress refers to the POA as an increasingly capable instrument of statecraft, a phrase that we heard the Admiral mention earlier and repeated by Professor Zhang, capable instrument of statecraft. So in my chapter, I highlighted some significant events in the East China Sea over the last 20 years or so. From infrequent voyages by surveillance vessels to multilateral exercises with the Russian Navy to the current constant encounters in the air and sea. We have charts and tables to show you the trend, and it is troubling. I also mentioned in the chapter some other sources of friction in the East China Sea, as mentioned before, the Senkaku Daoyu Island disputes, its overlapping EEZs and the PRC's declaration of the ADIS Air Defense Identification Zone in 2013. So Newton's third law of motion states that for every action, there will be a equal and opposite reaction. I listed Japan's reactions and adjustments to the phenomenon of the declarations and other incursions. And that I, I attempted to show a pattern of escalation in the gray zone in the, in the East China Sea. And I also compare that to their tactics in the South China Sea. And speaking of which, I don't know if Ryan's with us virtually or uh, if he's listening in, but now I hereby claim Ryan's chapter as my own based on irrefutable historical rights. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> so if we may briefly venture into chapter seven, Ryan's work, he described it as a geopolitical hotspot. I echo that sentiment wholeheartedly. I mean, South China Sea even made an appearance in the pop culture movie last year. Do you remember Barbie? For some reason, that 8 dash yeah. <laughs> right, that eight dash line had a two-second appearance, but somehow 
it garnished international attention. Right. So, as you know, there are multiple claimants in the South China Sea in addition to Beijing. And the PRC's gray zone tactics aim to change the perception in the region, however slowly, whether it's slicing the salami or slicing the cabbage, they're doing it. So if I may use a silly little example, back, um, back in my day, we come to accept we will tip 15% at restaurants and bars. But now when I go to Starbucks to buy a muffin or when I buy a hot dog at the hockey arena, at the end of the transaction, the nice little barista flips the, the register over and she expects me to give her another 18%. I don't know how we got here, folks. <laughs> and I don't know how we're going to go back to the before. And this is what Beijing is doing in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. By slowly, incrementally, increasing their presence, even without firing a shot, they are changing the perception. They're changing the narrative. And unless we stop them in 10, 12 years, the folks around that region will simply say, well, there goes their military barracks on these features, and that's their Coast Guard ship patrolling. I, I, guess, this is, I guess this is theirs. This is troubling, and this is something that we want to stop. Well, this is not all doom and gloom, of course, as uh, mentioned by Professor John. This, this is a mixed bag. While Beijing is figuratively marking its territory, it's also irritating its neighbors. And f for the moment, I don't see a whole lot of international support for Beijing's claims. And I don't think they will get any if they continue to behave the way they do. Thank you, James. So let me uh, push you a little bit on a, uh, any points of comparison you'd like to draw between China's approach toward Japan, another major power in the region, versus its, its approach in the South China Sea where it's dealing with much smaller countries with much uh, more limited resources to attempt to enforce their own kind of economic rights and, and territorial rights. I like, I like silly little analogies because I'm a simple Marine. So if I were to make a comparison, I would compare the East China Sea to a boxing ring. You have one combatant in the one corner, another in the other corner. Mano a mano, Tokyo versus Beijing. South China Sea would be a Royal Rumble cage match with one big fella and the smaller fellas around him, but it's not just the smaller fellows against the big fella, the smallest fellows are fighting amongst themselves too. And uh, the fight's just beginning. Pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that colorful uh, metaphor. Yeah. I think we've all got the picture there. So uh, next it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Melanie Sisson, a fellow in the Brookings Foreign Policy Program's Strobe Talbot Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology where she, she researches the use of the armed forces in international politics, U.S. national security strategy, and military applications of emerging technology. Dr. Sisson's work uh, is focused on the U.S. Department of Defense integration of AI currently uh, and machine learning capabilities into war fighting and enterprise operations. Melanie and I took on perhaps the least pleasant topic in this book, uh, which is namely the ways in which China is attempting to reshape the threat perceptions and risk assessments of the U.S. military and thereby the U.S. government. Um, this has primarily taken place through increasing pressure on our forward forces uh, who are exercising their rights to free navigation of international waters and airspace, uh, but also through the development of more impressive capabilities to have a steady state perception of threat by the U.S. forces in the region who now consider themselves operating under greater levels of risk than, than previously. Um, now, Melanie, I'd like to invite you to walk us through what you see as some of the main issues, uh, with, uh, uh, main issues of concern to China and also the main approaches that China has taken toward presenting these kinds of challenges to the U.S. 
uh, or the ways in which you see China attempting to reshape U.S. behavior. Great. Well, thanks, James, very much. It's um, First, I should say I'm a proud Stimson alum, and so it's wonderful to be back here. It's one of my favorite places in Washington, D.C., um, topped only by a couple, and Barry won't mind me saying this, he'll understand. Most of those other places sell martinis. So, <laughs> um, so this, I hold this place in very high regard and much, with much affection. And James, um, it's been a real pleasure to be involved with you and all of these wonderful colleagues on this project. Congratulations to the center and to you and the whole team for um, producing this wonderful book that I'm sure everybody will, will pick up on their way out, um, as you suggested. So um, you're right that we g examined some of the changes in um, China's perceptions of its international environment um, and uh, how it has responded to a lot of the dynamics that it both likes and dislikes about that new international environment. And so, you know, looking to put this in a bit of context will help us to understand, I think, some of the other dynamics that, that our colleagues have um, discussed so ably. So, you know, the, we're all well familiar that in the post-Cold War era, the United States was the world's preeminent military power. Um, it was described, in fact, in the 2018 National Defense Strategy as a military that could go where it wanted, when it wanted, and do what it wanted. Um, we had a busy military during that time. During that period, there was a lot of, of course, focus on destroying terrorist organizations uh, worldwide. Um, but the military also was occupied uh, by demonstrating that the United States is a global power and that it will seek to promote and defend its interests globally. Um, China also was busy during the post-Cold War era. Um, it had been jarred into this recognition not just of what the U.S. military was capable of abstractly, but had seen it put into practice very directly in the Middle East. Um, and figured that it needed to make some changes itself. And so uh, the PLA during that time focused its own military on developing new concepts and capabilities, the ones that it would need to become Asia's preeminent local military power. And that meant modernizing the PLA in ways that would counter U.S. strengths um, and that could take advantage of our vulnerabilities, most especially uh, in a contingency over Taiwan. So to do that, the PLA developed a strategy that I think really does two important things. The first is that it capitalizes on geography, and the second is that it recognizes the significance of new information technologies. So capitalizing on geography means simply what has been mentioned prior, making it much harder and much more costly for the United States to operate in China's neighborhood and its surrounding seas, um, especially if China doesn't want us to. To do that, uh, China invested in a lot of new and emerging technologies to do with in, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, ISR, um, but also, as the Admiral pointed out, um, attack submarines, naval vessels broadly, um, and a very large complement of missiles with a variety of ranges that can be launched from a variety of platforms to threaten regional U.S. bases and any assets that we might try to move into or through the region in time of war. The second element, the recognition of how important new and emerging information technologies are, resulted in shifting the PLA's focus away from mass and attrition and toward an emphasis on digitized information. Um, and specifically, that means working to retain the security and function of its own digital information systems and on degrading, corrupting, capturing or destroying U.S. sensing, targeting, communications, and command and control systems. And this is in all domains, including and especially in space. This strategy and those investments, together with some organizational reforms, have made the PLA a much more formidable force than it had been for decades prior. It's improved both in capacity and in capability. And it's convinced most military analysts here, uh, at least in Washington and probably more broadly um, in the United States and, and beyond, that a conventional conflict now between the United States and China in a Taiwan contingency is essentially a toss-up. And of course, that toss-up would be uh, very expensive and very bloody. And that very expensive and very bloody toss-up um, would happen in the shadow of possible nuclear escalation. Much uh, has been made about China's expansion and modernization of its nuclear arsenal. Uh, and we can certainly talk about that further if there's interest. But suffice for now to say that the PRC is a nuclear power. And it's committed, clearly, uh, 
to retaining the ability to retaliate with nuclear weapons if it's ever attacked with a nuclear weapon. So in addition to changing the local balance, China's space and cyber capabilities now also mean that we have to be prepared for intrusions into our own domestic infrastructure here in the United States. We have to acknowledge the possibility that the PRC might attack a critical system here at home. So putting that all together, what we have is a PRC that's nuclear armed, that can credibly threaten to use conventional and cyber capabilities to impose costs on our regional military bases, on our military assets broadly, and on the US homeland, and that's capable enough that we can't predict who would win a war. So by most standards, I think I feel safe in saying that uh, that meets the definition of a force that's full well capable of implementing a variety of strategies of deterrence and of coercion more broadly. So when we talk about, in this case, deterrence and how China has positioned itself to deter US intervention uh, in, for example, a Taiwan contingency, we always have to keep in mind that what we mean by an effective deterrent is something that addresses and accesses uh, what we care about. Um, threats move us when they promise to take away or to damage something that we value and specifically something that we value more than the contested issue in the moment. So the PRC is assessing these things about us uh, and it's arriving at its judgments and we need to do the same. This is an area where I think we haven't quite accessed the level of debate that we need to, um, in particular about clarity around whether and why the status of Taiwan is of enough significance to the prosperity and security of the United States that we would fight a high-end war over it. Um, China's very clear it's a core interest. Is it a vital U.S. interest as well? We need, we need to know that, and we need to be able to talk about that directly and forcefully. Um, it also requires us, therefore, to answer two questions. How much cost are we willing to accept, and of what kinds? We will need to have answers to those questions. And we, I think, need to be mindful of answering those questions with the knowledge uh, that the history of warfare is one in which the entering in estimates of costs have more often been erroneously low than they have been erroneously high. And we now, again, have to include the possibility of costs that might be exacted here at home. Uh, I personally uh, don't see a good way to predict what those costs might be. We don't know how, for example, the U.S. population might respond to uh, an intrusion into a critical system in the United States. So we don't know how they'll behave under those circumstances. And we don't know those things because there's really no precedent. So I think uh, it's really just right and proper at this point, given these conditions, given these circumstances, that policymakers are deterred from looking first to military solutions, to the kinds of conflicts of interest and policy problems um, that we've discussed uh, before here and elsewhere. And I think it's also important to remember that it's their jobs to be really selective and extremely judicious when determining whether and how to use threats or applications of force to pursue uh, policy objectives more generally. Very well said. Thank you very much. I think that that makes plain the case for some degree of mutual deterrence in this relationship. And I think we've seen a lot of evidence for that on the Chinese side, that China very clearly seeks to avoid a conflict with the United States and has for the history of the PRC. Uh, with one glaring exception in Korea. And uh, I think that one of the lessons I took from this study is that China really has uh, decided not to escalate to the use of conventional force in uh, virtually all instances. Um, and so what that tells me is not only that China doesn't want a fight with the United States, but that China is sensitive to what it regards as the political costs of using military force in addition to merely the, the military ca calculus. In other words, there are instances where China could clearly prevail through a direct application of force, and it has chosen not to do that in some instances. I think Ketian has identified the correct explanation for that, which is simply that China is conscious of the political downside of being perceived as a military aggressor. Um, and that that would be the, that would be the inevitable consequence of, of choosing to use force. Uh, so what that implies to me is that uh, 
resistance on some level works. And that the greatest need for U.S. support, military and diplomatic support, uh, goes to the weaker states in the region. Uh, we have allies in the region who are largely capable of keeping China at bay uh, on their own, but that is not the case for many of the sort of competing claimants in the South China Sea uh, who really are at a disadvantage in terms of their ability to patrol their own exclusive economic zones and to effectively enforce their economic rights uh, and legal rights. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that while greater levels of U.S. direct support to these countries may be uh, an effective means of imp increasing their capacity, um, it may also exacerbate tensions with Beijing and drive a negative cycle if the uh, response is a military first kind of response. And so I think Melanie's made a, a, a good case for thinking about the other tools in the toolkit along with the role of our armed forces in, in providing stability uh, and deterrence to, to regional partners and allies. Uh, we are on track for Q&A at this time, so I'd like to invite you all to raise your questions. We've had a few questions come in online as well that I'll start to uh, dole out, but please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and if you are online, please send your questions to stimson.org slash questions. So the first question I'll take from an online uh, guest is, can somebody explain to us the difference between this Chinese win without fighting employment of its military forces and the endlessly repeated deterrence that U.S. security policy is apparently designed to maintain, especially but not only with respect to China? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take moderator's privilege to, to answer this question directly, which is to say that the United States strategic aims in the Indo-Pacific are to maintain the status quo and to preserve the territorial integrity of countries in the region to prevent military aggression from occurring. And China's goals are to assert territorial claims that overlap with the existing territorial claims of U.S. partners and allies oftentimes in the region. And so I think that that's a key driver of tension in the relationship. China wants what others already have in their effective control or possession. And that implies a revisionist uh, strategic aim. Now, at the same time, China has been asserting its claims principally through economic extraction, right? Exploitation of fishing and oil exploration uh, means. And then also through this kind of constabulary presence where they're patrolling the waters and trying to assert China's legal jurisdiction uh, over those areas. And so it has not yet, at least since the 70s, attempted to dislodge other countries from the territories under their possession. I find it unlikely that uh, China will attempt an amphibious landing on 2nd Thomas Shoal to displace the Philippines garrison there, for example. This is a, a you know, current event. There's ongoing tensions over 2nd Thomas Shoal the key driver there is not actually who's in possession of the shoal, in my opinion, but rather what's going on on the shoal. And China's responding to something that they've responded to consistently over the past few decades, which is the addition of construction materials and, and uh, efforts by the Philippines to create permanent housing, essentially, or a permanent uh, garrison there. Um, so. There are specific things that China is responding to, but overall the difference is that the United States doesn't have revisionist aims in the region, China does. Um, the next question uh, speak, I think goes best to, to Jimmy, though anybody else who'd like to volunteer is welcome to, to speak up. Uh, what do you see as China's rationale for using gray zone tactics against Japan over its dispute in the East China Sea versus avoiding similar tactics against South Korea in its dispute surrounding the Yellow Sea? Ooh. Wow, that's a PhD level question, and I, got, I have to think on the spot. 
That's a that's a good one. I. You're allowed to wave off if you'd rather. Yeah, I, I think I'll wave off for the time being. This this will require some thought. Yep. Do you have, I, please. Maybe if I can offer, so I don't really study the Yellow Sea per se, but my guess um, is that China claims um, territorial meets territorial claims on the rocks in the south, uh, sorry, in the Sankaku Islands, but I don't think China has <coughs> territorial claims in the Yellow Sea. I think that might be a, there might be some mar maritime jurisdictional differences um, that China actually also has with, for example, Indonesia, but we don't see China using coercion on Indonesia, but we do see China using coercion on Japan or, say, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, et cetera. So I think that might be uh, one of the, the, the differences. Um, and I think there might be an additional layer in the sense that um, uh, China does not, and China acknowledges that it does not want to piss off everyone. <laughs> so in the East China Sea area, it does still want to have at least one country that is relatively neutral or slightly more friendly to, to China, which I think South Korea uh, is. So that might be an an explanation, and one of my colleagues, um, um, Joy Shu Xianluo, who's an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii, has done a lot of research on the comparison between the Yellow Sea and the uh, Center for Islands. Excellent. I, I was, uh, the, your latter point was going to be my suggestion as well. That China values its relationship with South Korea and doesn't want to alienate every country in its periphery. Dr. Barry Blackman. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd like to suggest a hypothesis and get your response. So it seems to me, as the panel has said, China's been very successful in the South China Sea, incrementally making it more and more feasible to exploit the resources of the region. But when I look at Taiwan, I'd argue that China's been counterproductive in its military coercion, that it can't no sane Chinese leader can look favorably on a invading Taiwan, the geography, the topography, the difficulty of mounting such operations, or a blockade. If you look at Russia in the Black Sea vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, it's obviously very difficult. They have, so they have two ways to gain their objectives with Taiwan. One is to uh, persuade the Taiwanese that it would be better for them to unite that would be better economically, better in terms of the way of life, but that's not going anywhere, right? Because you look at Hong Kong, it's clear what the consequences of that are. So the other way is to coerce the Taiwanese. So they figure if China invades, the cost of resisting would be too great. And perhaps together with covert ops, they manage to mount us an invasion and the Taiwanese government collapses. But when you look at the opinion polls, for example, Taiwan's, the Taiwanese are uh, less, less and less willing to look favorably on unification. And when you look at the effect on the U.S., we're more, not totally overtly, but more overt in our support of Taiwan. So that's the th hypothesis. Success in the South failure, counterproduction in the North. I value your opinion. That, that is consistent with my takeaways on this study. Um, in brief, I'd like to invite the other panelists to weigh in. Any, any dissenting views or any uh, supporting evidence you'd like to pile in? I have some evidence. Yes. <laughs> so I can, there's a very fascinating survey out of Taiwan. Um, I'll have to double check the year, but it's fairly recent. It asks whether the Taiwanese would, or the, the people of Taiwan would consider unifying with China if it was more similar economically, socially, politically to Taiwan. So if China was, say, a liberal democracy with a, uh, an economy, a GDP per capita similar to Taiwan. And the Taiwanese still would not consider unification under that scenario. They would prefer to continue the status quo or remain nominally separate from China. Um, and the, if the situation is as it is today, where China has a very different economic and political situation, social, um, a, a society, they also do not want to unify overall. Melanie. Yeah, thanks. So, so first, actually, I'm going to do something annoying and do a go back to the very first question that asked about this difference between win without fighting and deterrence. 
Um, and then just two quick points. The first is deterrence is a very specific term with a very specific meaning in that it is an effort to persuade another actor not to do a thing that you don't want them to do. But it is part of a general category of thing called coercion. And all of coercion is an attempt to win without fighting. Right? And so we, we want to acknowledge that insofar as though there's not a direct uh, comparison between win without fighting and deterrence, but there is um, with a lot of the other kinds of activities, inclusive but not exclusive to um, deterrence. The United States coerces all the time, and this is not uh, a malevolent or a malign thing. This is a lot of statecraft. Um, an inducement is a form of coercion where you try to get your way without having to bludgeon somebody into doing it. And so there, there is at least some conceptual uh, likeness uh, between these sorts of approaches. So enough of that. And, and to, to address a little bit this question about Taiwan, I don't disagree with the diagnosis of Taiwanese perceptions of the PRC at this point and whether or not unification will be desirable. A lot of these polls also you know, um, indicate that there's, as one would expect generationally, a real attachment to being uh, you know, a to, to the Taiwan people as an identity, right? That someone is Taiwanese, they're not Chinese. Um, and I also wanna highlight that the United States has a role in this dynamic as well. Um, a lot of what the Taiwan people seem to want is to maintain the status quo. Uh, peace and stability, to be able to go about living their lives, to make votes based primarily on livelihood issues, kitchen table issues, and not on the possibility of cross-state conflict. We are doing things that are um, raising the temperature in ways that are uncomfortable, and this is not lost on the Taiwan people. These same surveys, um, there was one in June, I think, of 2023, you know, highlights two things about how the Taiwan people regard U.S. involvement in, in the cross-strait uh, issue. And it, two findings uh, that I would just point out is that um, a lot of uh, Taiwan people actually think current rates of defense spending by the Taiwan government are either correct as they are or too high. <laughs> so there's a lot of conversation here about how much is being spent on Taiwan's defense by the Taiwan people and what that indicates. Um, that same survey indicates uh, that a plurality of people think that the United States will come to Taiwan's defense if China attacks uh, for unprovoked reasons, but they also think that the United States is not a trustworthy country. So around 70% uh, responded and said the United States is not a trustworthy country. So you know when you take all of these things together, they're in a bit of a bind. They certainly don't seem to think unification is a pleasing idea. Um, they're certainly not advocating uh, strenuously for independence and would prefer very much to sort of have things quietly proceed uh, as they have been for as long as possible. That's sort of the, my sort of generalized assessment of, of the Taiwan people's thinking about whether or not Taiwanese or uh, Chinese coercion is working, but also whether or not the United States is being additive or, or unhelpful to that status quo. Questions? Ma'am, in the back. In 1999, The Economist um, magazine suggested that the end result of the One China policy would be that more Chinese um, mainland people would end up taking Taiwanese um, spouses. And that was many years ago, obviously. Is there been any, you know, I'm thinking about Joe Nye's soft power idea there, and, and has there been any, has that happened? I mean, is there any way that the Taiwan-Japan, I mean, Taiwan-China uh, divide can be, I don't know, tackled in a different way? You know, interesting, you know, prognostication on the part of the economist. Any additional thoughts on cultural, economic integration? 
can take a very light stab at this, um, not, not so much through the cultural lens, um, but one of my colleagues, Mark, Dr. Mark Has, has written a lot about generational changes as well as demographic changes. And I think his main thesis is that as a country ages, in particular, for example, China is an aging population, uh, the population might tend to be a little bit more peace prone. Um, mostly because of um, a lack of war fighting capability, um, lack of um, um, economic growth or the drivers of economic growth where sort of the working age population will contribute a lot to. So I guess if we take these theses uh, to apply to cross strait relations, then the prognosis might be a little bit more positive than uh, or optimistic than, say, the contemporary uh, situation. Um, I don't know for sure. I think it's difficult to make predictions, but I think um, the demographic changes or societal changes might be an interesting factor in terms of um, uh, thinking about uh, future cross strait relations, especially, um, say, after the current um, generations of the CCP leadership um, uh, just moves on, um, <laughs> there might be some additional changes that it's going to be a little bit more optimistic. Excellent observation. All right, so I'm afraid we only have time for one more question. Ma'am? Um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about the different exchange between, for China, between gradually um, increasing its presence in these disputed areas to change the status quo, but that coming at political costs with, in the region as well as escalation costs, with, uh, especially with Japan. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on to why these particular territories were so central to um, Chinese national strategy in that region that they would risk those kind of escalation costs or that kind of um, bad political will in, in the region to achieve this slow status quo change. Very difficult question. Uh, Jim, do you have a thought? I, I'll take a first stab at the question um, without, without going too much into UNCLOS international law. It, I, I will simply say it's about territory and it's about resources. So one, one island grants a country 12 nautical miles of sovereignty and 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone. So using a math chart, you can see just one little island, high, a high tide feature can grant a country exclusive rights to the fish, the oil, the gas, rare earth elements. So there's a practical motivation to, uh, to claim these territories. I'd, I'd say that that explains 75% of it, perhaps. And the other 25% of it, I would explain through reputation. Uh, in other words, China has made these claims historically. The Republic of China made these claims historically. And so, in essence, because it's already been said, it would require a sort of reputational cost for China to back away from already asserted territorial claims. So I think that that's a tall order. Uh, to ask of any country. And my suggestion for a kind of modus vivendi is to work towards ignoring the territorial claim for the sake of practical economic development that benefits all claimants, uh, perhaps through joint development zones, as they've attempted to establish with Japan, um, but that the territorial disputes should not be permitted to result in war out of proportion to the economic benefits that they provide. Uh, there's, that's the real danger. Uh, so China has uh, principles, claimed principles, about how they look at the South China Sea. And one of those principles uh, is respect for conditions on the ground and also respect for regional countries. I think uh, there's, there are ongoing negotiations over a code of conduct for managing South China Sea issues. And those kinds of diplomatic initiatives probably provide the best hope for avoiding conflict over these territorial disputes. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And please join me in thanking our excellent panelists for today's conversation. And thank you to Admiral Fogo for joining us for keynote remarks.
Well done, sir.